Hello, and welcome to the COM300 module on doing criticism. We're going to try and crack the curious case of doing criticism. The objectives for this model are to understand some of the basic parts of criticism, including description, analysis, interpretation, and evaluation. Second is to use the types of arguments to make some claims about artifacts. We'll review those briefly. Third is to explore your possible reasons for choosing a method of analysis or a search model. And fourth, to reflect on your own work environment and the nuts and bolts of assembling and organizing your notes and sources. As always, the working vocabulary is there um, and you'll be accountable for that on the quiz. Let's talk about description. So why does describing your artifact help overcome glandular criticism? Well, description is to ca characterize the message under analysis. It's, it's very important to start taking notes and systematically go through your speech or your artifact um, and really begin to kind of describe what's happening in the particular artifact that you're studying. Glandular criticism is when um, you react, but you don't know why, and sometimes you make snap judgments and say, oh, I, I like that because there was a lot of action in that movie. And, and it's not really based on a close description or anything. So, you know, description is important to begin thinking systematically about your artifact. Description is not retelling. We don't just retell the artifact or um, completely insert the speech into our paper. No. What we do is we focus on the most important or the most relevant elements of the message and we bring those in as part of our, um, part of our criticism. And there are things that you can describe, you know, there are a lot of things, but um, generally the context of the situation of the speech uh, or the artifact, the background of the author or the rhetor, uh, the audience, the nature of it, uh, sections of the message, important patterns that emerge and so forth. There's lots of things that you can be describing. Some examples here then. Um, in a classical critique of Malala Yousafzai's speech to the United Nations, she um, got shot in Pakistan. You may remember she was young and uh, um, she was advocating before the UN for the education rights of women and children. And this is a description of how she's using God and devil terms, the light and the darkness um, that she sees, and making an analogy um, between that and pens and books and guns. Um, so uh, an interesting description there uh, from a classical point of view. Another description example is uh, in an ideology and gender critique of ESPN, the magazine's Bodies We Want, 2011, and particularly focusing on depictions of Hope Solo, at that time a very uh, famous uh, American soccer goaltender. So the description here starts with someone else com completely, Jenny Finch, and describes how she's depicted, and then it moves to the depiction of Hope Solo and describes um, in what ways uh, she's depicted there. Simple, fairly straightforward examples of description. Critical analysis. Critical analysis is where we're not just describing now, we're actually getting into the systematic discovery, identifying the various parts of a message, the various elements of that message, and the relationships between those parts. So we're looking at identifying the parts of the message and looking particularly for relationships. Foss would call this coding the artifact, right? And second, we uncover the choices that the authors or the creators made when they constructed the message. So those are kind of important aspects of critical analysis. There's a couple examples here. One is the classical critique, uh, again, of uh, Yusuf size. And in this instance, uh, the argument that she's making is um, that she is, she is bringing forward the several different uh, types of religion in an effort to um, raise uh, compassion in the audience and also to kind of unify the audience as well. So it's a critical analysis of specific parts of the speech and, uh, and how they kind of interrelate 
to do something. In the ideology and gender critique of uh, ESPN, um, this instance is, uh, this analysis here is talking about the difference between the idea of this section, which was to show the beauty and the strength of female athletes, but then the actual um, presented elements show that they're undermining that idea that there's an ideology beneath it um, that, um, and, and then they go on to describe exactly how they undermine her athletic prowess, how the pose de-emphasizes her muscles, um, and things like that. One important thing about analysis is that it's dependent what you're looking for, the parts that you're trying to identify, depend on what method you're going to use. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, the search model or method of analysis. Why are they useful to you? Well, a search model is a kind of an organized set of concepts that provide us with a ready-made um, group of ideas to examine a question and question a particular message. So you could think of it as a framework or a lens, um, or maybe even a paradigm to look at a particular message. It becomes a starting point for analysis of the message and the different search models, of course, are going to highlight different aspects of the artifact. Is it dramatic? Is there guilt and victimage? Um, is it story-like? There, are there characters and, and a plot? Um, is it about the type of music or the type of movie that's being made? Um, so it focuses on different things. And as I mentioned, Foss says that these concepts in the search model are things that we focus on uh, for, our, um, for our analysis of coding. And here are some examples of search models that we'll be talking about in, in this course. And of course, there's the question mark. So <clears throat> after analysis, then, we, we come to interpretation. Interpretation is to draw conclusions about these rhetorical patterns discovered in the analysis, to decide what do those choices mean. So you want to bring your personal self, your personal reactions to it. That's important. But you also want to bring a balcony stance that's a little more systematic and looking at actually what's in the artifact, not just your snap impressions. You want to balance those two so that you're bringing your personal reactions, but you're also bringing kind of a systematic analysis that makes reasonable interpretations about what's going on in the artifact. If you don't do a very thorough analysis, then oftentimes you get weak interpretations. And unfortunately, the first interpretations that you make are usually often the ones that you stick with and you ignore other evidence. So it's kind of important to do a thorough analysis so that then when you start drawing interpretations, um, you can draw them on the basis of important things uh, that you found in the artifact. Examples, again, the critique of uh, Yusofzai's speech um, here is where um, she's talking about how um, seeing oneself as a fragment of the puzzle, she invites the audience to feel similarly to her aims and elicits compassion. She talks about pride and says, you can be prideful about feeling compassionate for the women and the girls who are not getting uh, education and so forth. So essentially, she's talking a little bit about the different parts of the speech and then saying, well, here's sort of what they mean. Here's what she's doing with those parts, the choices that she's making. In the ideology and gender critique of ESPN, again, this is uh, um, talking a little bit about um, the, um, the relationship between beauty and strength and how, um, in, in this instance, they are conforming the ladies, the pictures of the women athletes, to uh, a particular ideology that women must still be admired for their feminine sex appeal, not their athletic strength. And so um, even though the idea is, is that we highlight the inner relationship of beauty and strength, what emerges is not strength, but just the focus on beauty. And um, so again, that undercuts the idea of the special issue. And finally we come to evaluation where we say here's what's up with this 
with this particular artifact. The use of stated criteria to determine the merit, worth, significance, or effectiveness of the rhetorical strategies in a message. So the first challenge is, what are my criteria to evaluate? You know, in, in classical criticism, you'll have to analyze the effect of the speech. And, and that's a criterion for classical criticism. So you need to make an evaluation of the effectiveness of the speech. And uh, in any of your evaluations, when you move on to paper two and other uh, search models, um, you can use words like uh, inappropriate, unethical, better, worse, right, wrong, good, bad, and so forth. But for the classical critique, we focus on effective and ineffective. The example again from Yusafzai's speech is the effects of the speech extended far beyond the UN chambers. And then they quote um, someone talking about the speech and the effect that it had. And that's, that's actually really important. It really strengthens your case to get quotes from people who were talking about your artifact or your speech in support of your point about the effect of the speech. In the ideology and gender critique um, of, uh, of uh, Hope Solo's image, um, essentially this, this talks about how um, this has kind of failed the ideological critique, which is they have this idea of beauty and strength, but what they end up with, based on how the images are used, is really a false consciousness. So even though there's an idea that beauty could be found in strength and in masculine qualities, girls are again bound to the idea that beauty has only one definition, traditional, subservient, graceful women. And that's why this artifact is considered important because it had the potential to present an objection to those kinds of stereotypes, but it failed. What are the six types of arguments, and uh, why are they important to you? Critics are in the business of giving good reasons for their claims about an artifact. That's what we do. We take a position on an artifact, and we try and justify that to other people reading our criticism. These different types of arguments are therefore resources for making your critical points. You can go to them and say, have I, have I found one of some of these? Can I use that kind of argument here? And then finally, in the Logos module, we're going to revisit these and pay more attention to the strengths and weaknesses of the argument types. So quickly, argument by example. You give one or more illustrations, you make a general claim. In FDR's speech, he gives examples uh, there's examples here of uh, phrases of devil terms like treachery, unprovoked, and dastardly attack. And so the larger conclusion of these examples is that the ethos development in that speech is not about FDR or the American people. It's about the Japanese empire and the negative uh, credibility that they have. Argument by analogy, comparing two somewhat similar items to draw conclusions about from one to the other. Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech, there's a comparison of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to bounced checks, right, marked insufficient funds. And so what he does is, is he taps into the power of this analogy uh, because that's a shared experience that many people in his audience will have had. Argument from cause, the ability of, of X to influence the occurrence of Y, so almost any effect analysis that you do is a causal argument. FDR's critique of Japanese character, his use of the examples of Japanese attacks, and his quiet but firm tone led Congress to declare war. Okay, now there might have been an alternate clause, like a, a major attack on a U.S. city. But having said that, um, that at least counts for what is a causal claim in a criticism paper. Argument from sign. Something else is an indicator or the presence of something else, right? So um, Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address draws on the sacrifice of the soldiers and the government of, by, and for the people, which is a clear sign that he is using the occasion to try and unify a war-torn nation, right? So these two things, the sacrifice and the government form 
are signs that he is trying to unify the nation. Argument from principle. You're familiar possibly with syllogism, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. So all men are mortal, star is a man, therefore star is mortal, right? Well, when we, when we analyze principles, we can ask, you know, how strong or how valid are they? And, um, you know, as an example, a recent Supreme Court decision on, on gay marriage used the principle of equal before the law. All Americans should have equality before the law to make a decision about whether to protect gay marriage or not. When one of those parts is missing, when there's only two things, then instead of a syllogism, it's an enthymeme. And slyly, the audience kind of fills in that missing part. So in FDR's speech, he argues that Americans have righteous might and that we will win through to absolute victory. But what's missing there is the minor premise, which is kind of sketchy, right? Is it true that righteous right always wins through to absolute victory? And the answer, based on history, is no, not always. So as an argument from principle, this might rally the American people, but it's not a very sound argument. And finally is argument from authority, where you use the actions or ideas of particular famous people to support some kind of a critical, or sometimes quotes, to support a critical claim that you're making. The example here is against the claim that the press is the enemy of the people. I'm going to quote philosopher Hannah Arendt, who writes that, no, that's not true. A free press is essential to the people knowing what are lies and what are not lies, and uh, being able to make decisions and so forth. So those are the argument types. The next question is what factors you should consider when deciding on a search model. And you should consider a variety of factors when you make a decision. For the first paper, no decision. Classical criticism. That's your search model. I lock it down. For the second paper, then you have more flexibility. So ask yourself, what are the central tendencies of the artifact? What are the key moves? What do I see a lot of? If there's a lot of drama and victimage and guilt and blaming, maybe dramatism. If there's characters and plot development and narration, maybe it's a story, right? Um, if you're going to do a metaphor analysis, there better be metaphors in your, art, in your artifact. That's pretty straightforward. Um, what kinds of things puzzle you? What are you interested in? Are you interested in drama and victimage? Are you interested in modern day myths? Um, are you uh, um, engaged in a social movement? Are gender issues important for you? Sometimes you can find or gravitates towards a method based on the kinds of things that you're interested in. Um, I think you also have to ask, does the vocabulary make sense to you? If it doesn't make sense to you, you're going to be in trouble from the get-go. So find one that as you read through and study and analyze, that, hey, this actually makes some sense to me. Last, I get a question about blending concepts. Can I mix methods? So the answer is, um, I prefer that you do one primary method of analysis and then bring in something else. So you could do um, ideology criticism and then maybe bring in some gender uh, arguments. Or you could do uh, narrative criticism and then maybe you know, bring in some elements of dramatism. Right. So um, one primary method. You want to be sure and avoid lots of little shallow points. Even if you're blending ideas, you want to make sure that you have two or three well-developed main points. And finally, the implication should be sure, that section at the end on so what, should be sure to say and justify the mix of concepts. Why is it particularly helpful to look at this and this in this artifact? Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of how you take your notes and convert them into a usable outline for a paper. I'm old school. I usually take my notes on a legal pad, going through the artifact, looking at my sources and taking notes and, and so forth. And, and then once I finish with my notes on the legal pad, then I get on my computer and I type up an outline drawing from the notes. So I organize them um, right there on the outline. 
some people um, prefer to cut up little strips of paper like Foss talks about. Uh, I used to use 4x6 index cards to take notes and then would file the, um, the index cards into groups and categories and so forth. That's how I wrote my dissertation. Um, but, but it's up to you. The point is, is that you need to think about, all right, I have to take a bunch of notes. I have to go through and describe some of what's happening in the artifact and look at some sources. And then how do I translate that easily and effectively into an outline format? Let's talk about the outlines. They're required for every paper. They are a huge time saver. A lot of people don't like or don't understand, but if you have an effective outline with nice, clear titles and good subpoints that give examples and analysis about the title, you've got 60% of your work done. When you sit down to write the paper, then you don't have to dream up or create or anything. You can just go through the outline and, and write it up. And it's not inscribed in stone. You want to get halfway through and you want to change it, yeah, that's fine. Um, but ultimately, the, um, the outline should be done before the paper is started to get the benefits of it. And the outline of the paper, ultimately at the end when you turn it in, should match. The titles and so forth should match from the paper to the outline. And finally, the organizational exercise that we do is kind of focused on this process. So you'll take notes that I have made going through a speech and then take those notes and organize them into a structure as if you were um, going to write that paper um, and then turn in the outline. So it kind of helps along some of those lines. Post this. Which of the four aspects of criticism, description, analysis, interpretation, evaluation, do you struggle with the most? And why do you think that's true? What types of arguments um, do you think are most commonly used by critics? Uh, and, and why would that be? So um, post one of those, and then be sure and comment on other posts. So this is the module on doing criticism. For me, criticism is like play. You're looking for clues, you're solving mysteries, you're trying to find cool artifacts that are interesting and intriguing and explore why they have um, certain features and what choices were made when they were constructed. To me, this is the really cool part of rhetorical criticism. So from the front lines of the curious case of doing criticism, have a great day.